Mr. Smith, I've looked over your resume, your credentials. Why do you want to work here at KDKA? Oh, because I've heard Ken Rice is here, and that's why I've always <laughs> wanted to work with Ken Rice. Even before he was in television, I wanted to work with Ken Rice. He didn't know it at the time, but mm -hmm. back in the 60s, uh, when we were leading the revolutions, I wanted to be work with him. You've always been able to uh, spin a good yarn, and that's why <laughs> you've been so successful. So when the news came out that you were leaving, and people saw the headlines that said, 50 years in broadcasting, I heard a number of people say, impossible, he's too young. <laughs> well, that's nice to hear. How do you, so how do you start in broadcasting when you're five years old? Well, it, 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 it's not easy, but I did it. No, <laughs> it's almost close to the truth, because I used to, um, I, we had an Electrolux vacuum cleaner, and they had an automatic rewind on the, on the power cord. I used to pull that cord out and, and pretend that it was a microphone back when I was quite young. I, I really did. Uh, why, I don't know, but maybe that just shows that I was attracted to trying to be on television uh, from that point. Um, I'm 72, and so when you really take a look at my first job, paying job, uh, it was in 1967, so it's really been more like 54 years in, in broadcasting. No one believes you're 72, especially because you've been in a profession that takes a toll. You should be, you should look much older for all of, because years in broadcasting are like three or four times a normal year, right? Yeah, but you know, when they stop allowing us to have scotch in the desk and cigarettes in the newsroom, <laughs> then you know, you, start, you, you don't age as quickly. Right, but, yeah. not that you ever partook, but you were aware yeah. of it. Oh, I was aware of it, right. yes. Yeah. All right, as a young man, in your late teens and 20s, did you have the voice that you have now? Were you born with that broadcasting voice? Yes, yes, um, it's, and I've always considered a, a gift. I really have. Um, as, as we might get into or not, uh, I had polio, and so a uh, good friend of mine, Lou Astorino, has always taught me that phrase, you know, when a, when a, when a door closes, a window opens, or however that phrase is. And I, I believe that the, the door closed somewhat on the physical abilities because of the polio, but the window opened with the voice. And I, I firmly believe that um, uh, God gives each and every one of us some sort of talent, and it's up to us to figure out what that talent is. Mine was easy. He gave me a voice. Did polio ever present uh, a hurdle to you in your advancing from one station to another? Not in the stations that I uh, took the jobs, no. Uh, I don't know whether it prevented me from de taking another job. There are, along the way, as you well know, there are interviews that come along or inquiries about whether you might be interested in moving on to another station. And uh, I had several of those through the years, and uh, I have no idea whether the polio would have impacted uh, somebody hiring me or not. So, so let's, let's go down the path that led you to KDK and Pittsburgh. Where did your career begin? Uh, first full-time job was at WLBC in Muncie, Indiana and that was in, in radio. I was working on a master's degree at Ball State University at the time, and they had a campus radio station, and the news director at WLBC was looking for someone because he were, the person there was leaving to go to South Bend, a bigger market. And he monitored the campus radio station, and I happened to be doing a newscast at that time, and um, uh, somehow I got a hold of my phone number, called me and said, I'd like to hire you, and without any, audition, any more audition or anything like that, uh, it's what I wanted to do, so my master's work has been on hold since then, and I took the uh, job at WLBC, and I worked there for about three months, three and a half months, and then I got a call from uh, WIFE in Indianapolis. Uh, they were looking for somebody, and they had heard me on, at WLBC, and again, really no interview. They just said, uh, they're offering me a job, so would I take it? Uh, and I did, so I was in Indianapolis for several years. And the same thing happened then uh, at WHAS in Louisville. They were looking for a new morning a morning drive news anchor, and um, I did interview with them. It was quite an interesting interview, uh, and, uh, and so I took the job at WHAS. Now, WHAS Louisville was a smaller market than Indianapolis, but I took the job because, A, it was morning drive, which is where you want to be if you're in radio, and then second, um, it, it had the two other little letters with it besides AM, FM. They also had TV with it. And I was thought, maybe there's a chance I could break into television if I take this job. Hmm. And it worked out that I did. You're, you're how old a man are you at that time? Oh, I went to WHAS in... Uh, you're 19, in your 20s. Uh, 1974. Uh, so um, I was probably 25 when I took that job. And um, worked on the morning drive radio. Um, was asked to fill in on a weekend anchor 
side on the TV side when the uh, female uh, anchor there, uh, Jane Van Ryan, was pregnant. And they said, you know, just for a couple of months, and then when she comes back, you're going back to radio. I said, okay, that's great. At least it gives me a shot. Well, when she came back from her mater maternity leave, they said, you've got to co-anchor Jane. So um, Jane and I co-anchored the weekend just for a short period of time. And working that shift, by the way, it was was going in at like 10 o'clock in the morning on a, on a Saturday. Uh, and you were the assignment editor, you were the reporter. At that time, we used film. I never shot film, but I did go back and help edit film uh, ed there. And then you were produced the newscast. You put it all together. You anchored the newscast, and you went home, and you got back up early Sunday morning and came back in and did it again. You didn't get out the mop in the bucket and, no. and do no. the custodial work. No, but work. you know, I think you will, you will agree that when you first start off in this business, you will do anything because oh, yes. it's, 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 it's what you want to do. Right. And if, if that's what it takes, that's what you do. Right. So in Louisville, did you start to, is that where you decided... I'm all about television now, radios. Yes. I'll leave that yes. behind. Yeah. I, I, as a matter of fact, I, one of the reasons they put me on is I had done a, um, a stand-up. Uh, I had covered something for the radio side and the TV side. It was like a, a county council meeting across the river in Indiana. And um, I was there covering it for radio. And the TV guy had shown up, and they, uh, they could not send a reporter. So the photographer had asked me uh, you know, to help do the interview with the with the TV mic, besides the radio mic. And I did, and I said, how about if I do a stand-up? And he kind of laughed. He said, sure. Well, I did a stand-up, and they put it on the news that night. And the next morning, the uh, assistant news director said, we're going to have to talk. So they, they liked what I had done, as far as that goes. Um, yeah, I, once, once the bug hits you on the television side, I don't think you necessarily would love to go back to radio. Now, I did radio here and TV at mm -hmm. KDK, but yeah. um, uh, it, once, once it was there, it's where I wanted to do. All right, so you're, you're in your mid-20s, you're in Louisville, you just got your first big break in television, but you didn't stay in Louisville long. No, I uh, didn't because uh, the competition apparently wanted me out of Louisville because all of a sudden I started getting calls uh, from a, uh, stations that were uh, part of the MAGID group of consulting. The stations were being consulted by MAGID. And so a lot of the stations that were being consulted by MAGID, uh, medium-sized cities, uh, were calling me. And so... Uh, so so let me, let, let's just slow down here. So this is interesting. So the competing stations in Louisville saw you, this fresh young reporter, anchor, and they decided, we don't want to compete against this guy. Let's do what we can to help him along in his career and get him out of here. I think that's probably fairly accurate. I don't know how much, I don't, can't say that they were necessarily scared of me, but they, uh, they didn't want to take a chance. And so um, they helped, helped move me along and interviewed several different places. And uh, the one that uh, really stuck out and, and we just melded immediately was uh, in Kansas City at WDAF-TV in Kansas City. <laughs> This is Action 4 Nightcast, Kansas City's most up-to-the-minute 10 o'clock news. Good evening. The jobs bill is in trouble tonight, all because of a freshman senator from Wisconsin. Uh, they were a very bad number three, and um, I took the job because it was a full-time anchor job, and, and, and I thought... They're already down. We can't go down anymore. So um, let's give it a shot. And went there and uh, with uh, Rita Channon, who was a co-anchor with me. Uh, within a year, we had gone from a bad number three tied number one. Hmm. Once in a while, you find a couple of people who just naturally work okay, well together, fine. who complement each other in every know. way, Maybe. like Stacy Smith and Rita Channon. What each can do well alone works even better when they're together. A natural sort of communication you just don't find every day. So it's no accident that more people are switching to Action News. Good evening, Good evening. I'm, I'm Rita Stacey. Channon. Stacy Smith and Rita Channon. Good, Good evening, evening. I'm, I'm Rita Channon. Kansas City's choice, naturally. It worked out well in Kansas City. And during my years in Kansas City, um, <laughs> I started getting phone calls from the... Uh, Primo group uh, who represented uh, KDKA and Westinghouse and um, a couple of times about Philadelphia and uh, several times about KDKA and 
on the, uh, April the 1st of 1983, I came in uh, for an interview and fell in love with the city. I was taken to dinner up on Mount Washington with the Ten Angel. And you know, how can you not fall in love with the city with that view from up there? And I seemed to mesh very well with Carolyn Ween, who was station manager, but was going to become the general manager and uh, with the news director. And we made a deal and I started here on, first day on the air was July the 4th, 1983. Okay, so 1983, correct me if I'm wrong, Pittsburgh is a top 10 market or very close to when it? I, I was 12 when I got here. And soon after I got here, I drove everybody away and we, we started sinking. <laughs> now we're in the 20s, but uh, so, not that the city itself, well, the city itself was about twice as big, but this, this surrounding area, we were the 12th largest metropolitan area in the country. Yes. So coming from Louisville, Kansas City to Pittsburgh, I mean, you were really on the, you're yeah. on the fast track. Yeah, I was 34 when I arrived here in Pittsburgh, and I had in my mind that I wanted to be in a, in a top five by, by the age of 40. Didn't work out, but that's okay, because I think I fell in love with Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh has always treated me extremely well, and um, there was no reason to leave. And are you a dad at this point? When yes, you, yes. So uh, you're, you're, my, your family's, you yeah. started your family when in I, Kansas when City? When we moved to uh, uh, Kansas City, uh, my daughter, uh, our, my first child, uh, was one month old when we made the move. Okay, so you were a little bit of a migrant worker there for a few <laughs> years, <laughs> exactly. but then you were rooted here, and this is where, this is home to your kids. Yes, your absolutely. Your kids' whole lives are growing up, going to school in Pittsburgh. Yep, my daughter was born in Louisville, my son in Kansas City, and then, but the only thing they really know is, you know, is Pittsburgh. Is Pittsburgh. Okay. All right, um, I want to reserve the right to go back and talk about some of the major sure. stories you covered Absolutely. in Kansas City in particular. But let's talk about the very beginning of your reporting career in Pittsburgh. You remember the first report you did for KDKA? First report that I did for KDK. well, first of all, my first night on the air was July the 4th, 1983 walked in to anchor the six o'clock newscast with Ray Tannehill. Patty Burns was off that day, and Ray was working the, the six and the 11. At that time, we only had the two newscasts of, of, in the evening and the late night. And uh, I sat down at the anchor desk, at which point Ray Tannehill put his arm hand out and said, hi, I'm Ray Tannehill. Uh, I said, I'm Stacy Smith. We never met before. Hmm. We sat down and anchored a newscast wow. together. Wow. And it, uh, it, it, went, it went pretty well, so uh, that was good. You guys were the team. Um, you, know, you may have already been working with Patty, no, Ray and I were the, were the team uh, from about uh, 83 to, I guess, Ray stepped down and from the 11 o'clock newscast around 90 or 91. The so. 90s, yeah, that sounds about right. More of KDKA's farewell to Stacy Smith right after this. Okay, back to your, so your first report, your first, first anchor shift is with Ray Tannehill. Right. Who you meet right, right. before you're about to say good evening. Exactly. To the city of Pittsburgh. Right. Yeah. Right. And then, um, and that was from Studio B, live from Studio B. Um, then the uh, first report that I did uh, uh, was uh, uh, Dick Thornburg, the governor of Pennsylvania at that time. And they had set that up for me to uh, interview him. Round the clock basis on any kind of proposals that uh, are raised. of dealing with a budget 1970s uh, for the last four years we've been able to avoid them one look at the level of spending that is appropriate for Pennsylvania in these troubled economic times I can't tell you that it was a you know the most outstanding interview I've ever done but uh, Thornburg always reminded me whenever I would see him from that point on that uh, he was my first interview in in, uh, in, in Pittsburgh and I interviewed him again uh, oh, several times, but the last time I think I really interviewed him while he was holding a position was that he was Attorney General and we interviewed, we went to Washington and interviewed him there and uh, kind of got a behind the scenes look at, at the Attorney General's offices there. That was fun. And he was already somewhat of a national figure because this is only a few years after Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island. And you know, he, his, his profile rocketed during that crisis. Yes. Um, okay, so your first field report your first live report, was it, am I correct saying it was a live report? Uh, no, no, it was not live. I don't believe we went live with it. Uh, if you're talking about the Simon and Garfunkel. That's what I was yeah. talking about. About a week after I was here, 
uh, Tom Rutkowski, the photographer, and I traveled to Akron, Ohio, because that was the first uh, venue for Simon and Garfunkel's reunion tour. Uh, and, and they had been separated for several years, and they decided to get back together. And so their, their first venue was Akron, Ohio, to kind of test everything before they went to the New York and wherever else. <laughs> And so we were there, and um, uh, uh, this is how great Pittsburgh is. Uh, we arrive, and there's a big news conference, and it's just packed in this hotel ballroom in, in Akron. And Simon and Garfunkel are all the way in the front, and our camera's all the way in the back. And I'm standing with the photographer, Tom Rutkowski, and the next thing I know, there's this little tap on my shoulder. And I said, yeah, you know, hi. And he said, tap me again. He said, you guys are from Pittsburgh. And I said, yeah. He said, yeah, I, I am too. I said, oh, that's great. I said, well, where from Pittsburgh? You know, he said, Penn Hills. I said, oh, great. And he said, I play in the band. I went, Tom. <laughs> we turned the camera around from Simon and Garfunkel. And it was the Sid McGinnis, who later was known, well known on the uh, Letterman program sure. as a guitarist. Sure. And so uh, it, it just shows you how Pittsburgh plays a part in just about everything. Another very quick story like that, covering the um, inauguration of Clinton in 96. We were going to the ball. It was a combined ball, I think, with Ohio at the armory in Washington, D.C., and it was pouring down rain. And we had a taxi, and we were stopped by police and said, you can't go any farther than this. And it was like two blocks away. And you know, we had equipment and the producer and myself, and it's, it's just, I mean, it's a downpour. And so, uh, we start to unload the cab, and we get the gear out, and they see KDK on the camera, the sergeant who was there. And he said, you guys are from Pittsburgh. Well, he said, yeah. He said, get back in the cab. You can, you can go all the way there. <laughs> so that, that, that was pretty neat. Let me guess. He was from Westmoreland County. Uh, you know, no. He, he was, uh, I can't remember exactly where okay. he was from. But. All right. Yeah, that, that phenomenon has happened to me, too. Pittsburghers yeah. are everywhere in quite a diaspora. And it says a lot about the call letters, KDKA. Oh, absolutely. People know it. Absolutely. More of KDKA's farewell to Stacy Smith right after this. Okay, so uh, other, there are some really, there's a lot to your highlight reel of your reporting at KDKA. Uh, notably, international travel, which is something we don't do a lot of anymore. We leave that to the network. But you had the opportunity to go um, several biggies here. You had the opportunity to go to Israel. Yes, 1991. The sounds of Israel, sounds of life and religion that have echoed through these mountains and valleys and hillsides for centuries. The lives of the people of Israel cannot be separated from their religions, and their religions cannot be separated from this land. It's what makes Israel so special and so different. It captures people's hearts and tears them apart. The sounds of Israel today are the echoes of this land's past. This is a KDK TV2 special presentation to On Assignment Inside Israel with Stacy Smith. Uh, we went with uh, uh, what was called a homecoming. It was a, a group of uh, uh, people of the Jewish faith who were taking a trip to uh, Israel. And I, uh, there may have been about 100, I'm not quite sure. And that was the first time that uh, 747 had landed at Pittsburgh Airport, International Airport. Uh, it was an El Al flight. And um, uh, so they, they brought it in and uh, we boarded it and then stopped in New Jersey, I think, and picked up some more people and then flew all the way uh, to Israel. It was quite a remarkable trip because um, Israel, in the end, is not that large of a country. You can almost travel from the northern tip all the way down to the Gaza Strip uh, in a day without any, without any problem whatsoever. But we spent uh, several days there, and it was uh, one of the first places we went was uh, to the uh, uh, Golan Heights. And uh, I was about as close to the uh, Syrian and Lebanese border as we are right now. For centuries, wars and battles have been fought over Jerusalem. 
Also for centuries, wars and battles have been fought over this rocky plateau known as the Golan Heights. Behind me, the green section that you can see is Israel. 24 years ago, where I'm sitting belonged to Syria. This now belongs to Israel. And it's just one more key part of the puzzle to bring about peace in the Middle East. And uh, when you see that vantage point, you can see why it's such a uh, logistical piece of land to have if there's going to be a war, because you're high above like this and you can fire uh, rockets or whatever from there. Um, we, we had an opportunity to uh, talk with uh, Yitzhak Rabin uh, on that trip. Uh, of course, he was later assassinated. He was running for prime minister. Uh, and also a very young, uh, at that time, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Is we that right? him uh, in a hotel there. Uh, Yad Vashem, um, all, all of the things that you want to do. We also went into uh, the Gaza Strip and interviewed a, a lot of Palestinians there. And at that point in time, which is what's so sad about what's happening right now, is, is that there was a great feeling that perhaps we're very close to being able to live together. There was a big, big push to, in the early 90s. And um, it's just, so what's happening now is just, uh, it just seems like it, it was never going to end. Yeah. It seems like that. And, and you were able to tell the story of these Pittsburghers who were seeing this all, I assume many of them, if not most of them, for the first time in their lives. And yes, what, yes, uh, many of them. Uh, the most moving part of that was Yad Vashem, which is, of course, the um, uh, Holocaust Memorial uh, in uh, Israel. And um, uh, had at least one or two people uh, who, it's a big room, and, and they have on the floor of the, of the room uh, a map of Europe and where the different concentration camps were. And uh, one or two of them would come out and stand on where their camp was and tell their story. And it was, mm. it was extremely moving. And then the museum itself, or the, the, the Germans and Nazis were meticulous about keeping records. And so if you are someone of the Jewish faith and you go there and you know you had a relative uh, who may have uh, perished in one of the concentration camps, they can start to look that up and tell you exactly when they, the train arrived, when your relative may have, uh, which camp they were in, and then when there's uh, probably when they died as well. I mean, it's, it's remarkable to, mm. that they have all of this information there. All right, uh, let's talk about your trip to Rome and the Vatican, and you got to meet Pope John Paul II? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, that was a historic trip in that uh, the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra was the first uh, orchestra from the United States to play in, at the Vatican. And uh, Pope John Paul II uh, was a, loved um, classical music, and so the uh, Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra went there along with the Mendelssohn Choir, and uh, Part of the uh, uh, trip included a, a chance to, uh, to meet His Holiness, uh, the, the Pope. Uh, that was on a Saturday, uh, the day of the, uh, of the concert, and uh, we were, the Vatican itself and the papal headquarters of uh, residence, it's, it's just spectacular as far as uh, the, the, the frescoes, the, the, I mean, it's, the artwork is just phenomenal. And then you, you you go around through this other area, and finally we met him in the library. And it was uh, Bishop Whirl, uh, at the time of Bishop of Pittsburgh, had set this up. And so uh, I think there were maybe 30 of us who had the opportunity to, to meet His Holiness. And this was a year before he died. So it's, it, he was not necessarily very active at that point. So he's, you finally round the corner and you go in toward the library and uh, like anybody does, you know, if there's a line in front of you, you kind of go like this to see, you know, around. And all you could see was this, was this white shoulder. Uh, I mean, the shoulder dressed in white. And uh, it just gave you chills because you knew who, who that was. When it was my turn, I walked toward the Pope as Bishop Whirl introduced me as Stacy Smith with television in Pittsburgh. And uh, it was, uh, as, a, as a Roman Catholic, it was quite, uh, quite a thrill, uh, quite moving to be able to meet, to meet him. And... Um, uh, you don't know what to say. <laughs> that, that to me was, was the biggest issue and I still not really quite sure what I said, but whatever I said, I always like to say that the, the last words that uh, Pope John Paul II said to me was thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>
and someone I assume was standing there introducing, someone introduced you. The uh, Bishop Whirl, now Cardinal Whirl, was seated directly to the uh, uh, Holiness's uh, right side. Uh, the, the Pope was on a little platform raised above everybody else. Not, not a great one, but just a little bit. And uh, so Bishop Whirl was just a little bit shorter in, in uh, height as, as you're going through this. And uh, I believe, if I remember hearing it correctly, uh, Bishop uh, said to the uh, Pope that uh, this is Stacy, uh, and he says it in Italian, Stacy Smith, Televisio Peaceburg. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, that was that. This is Stacy Smith from Pittsburgh. He's number one at six and 11. <laughs> just to he didn't quite say give that. Give the pontiff an yeah, idea right. who he was dealing with. Yeah, right. More of KDKA's Farewell to Stacy Smith right after this. Um, the evening of the, uh, the night in September of 1994, uh, you and Patrice King Brown had just concluded the six o'clock newscast? Right. Okay, and tell me, tell me what happened that night. We had just finished the six o'clock newscast and uh, I had just walked off the set and somebody had said to me, there's talk of a plane crash. Patrice had, had already left to go home to uh, have dinner with her two children. Uh, and so I was there and I said, well, you hear a plane crash, you're, you're thinking it's a small little sure. plane that is, is a crash. Mm -hmm. And then we get word that no, this is probably one. It's a it's a jet. It's a commercial jetliner. And so at that point, um, Connie Chung was filling in for Dan Rather that night, anchoring the CBS Evening News. And something that you you just don't do is is interrupt the national newscast I mean, with a local breaking story. You just you just don't do it. We did it. Uh, it was about ten after, maybe eleven, twelve after seven. And we went on just to say that there has been a plane crash, uh, the details of which we do not know, but it appears to be close to Pittsburgh International Airport. And then we interrupted again at about 7.24 or 25 uh, with a, just a little bit more information. You were with us at that point, and um, uh, you were one of the ones who uh, went out to the, to the site to, to handle reports for other stations around the country. Exactly right. I was not on the air in Pittsburgh. I was in a non-compete period right. in my migration from one channel to this channel. Uh, but I, I was aware that you guys were being carried not just in Pittsburgh, but nationally. Was it CNN that picked you up or was it CBS Apparently Network? they did. I didn't know it at the time, right. which is probably best that I, I did not know that at the time. We have crews at the scene, but as you can imagine, with a tragedy such as this, with 126 people on board this flight, the Philadelphia-based crew, that uh, uh, it is uh, extremely difficult for our news crews to be able to get to the scene and to be able to uh, uh, get more information. The officials who are at the scene, the police, the fire departments, uh, uh, FAA personnel, U.S. Air crew members, uh, uh, all tied up right now. And as soon as we can get more word from them as to exactly what happened, we will let you know. The probably the most poignant part of that story, besides the fact that it was a plane crash, um, is that you know we had had several phone calls and people were describing how the plane was coming in and it rolled over like this and went down. But these are eyewitnesses. You don't not you don't discount what the eyewitness says, but it's they're a distance away and, and that uh, you, you always want to uh, wait and uh, get more of an official word as to what's happening as opposed to what somebody else has to say about it because people's memories can be or, or thoughts can be influenced by something else. Sure. So the most poignant part of that was that um, while we felt it had absolutely crashed, nosedived into the ground, we were not sure. It, did it? Did it try to make a, a, a landing somewhere and then it, you know, burst apart or whatever? Uh, not knowing exactly what the terrain was, uh, we knew it was hilly, but that's uh, that's all I knew. Uh, our executive producer at the time, Jocelyn Howe, I'm I'm in the newsroom set, and she could walk all the way over to this side uh, and not be seen. And I'm at that point, Patrice is just probably getting back into the station. And Jocelyn went like this to me, so I'm on by myself. And, and I looked over at her and she said, she mouthed the words, 
And I looked back at the camera and I said, uh, just one moment, please. And I said, are you absolutely sure? And she said, yes. I still get choked up. Um, I turned back to the camera and took a breath and I said, there are no survivors. Now, the reason I get choked up over that and, and it's emotional is because, as you well know, sitting on the anchor desk, people are watching you, they're listening to you, and they want to believe what you're saying. And if you're going to say that there are no survivors, in the back of your mind you also know that there are relatives, there are friends, there are acquaintances of the people who are on that flight. And they're not getting any information yet from any place else, so they've tuned into television to watch. And you're the one who's telling them that all those people died. I, I take great responsibility in, in making sure that if I'm going to say that, that it's right. And that was, that was tough. And then uh, 2014, the anniversary, um, I was invited to speak to the survivors group, and I told that story, and there were about three or four people who mouthed the words, there are no survivors, as I said it, and then came up to me and said, that's how I learned. Mm. So for any young broadcaster out there, it's a big responsibility sometimes that you have. You and I both know that feeling when someone either comes up to us at our desk in the newsroom or it could be a phone call. We've got a big story. We are breaking in. We need you in the studio now. Heart starts pumping. Your head starts, you can lose your concentration because you're trying to think of everything you need, your microphone, your earpiece, and then you get out there and you're, you know, you're, your heart's still racing and the voice of the producer in your ear is at a higher pitch. Everybody is, is amped up and there's a little bit of chaos and I've always marveled at your ability to, I don't know how you do it, because it certainly gets to me when I'm out there, uh, but you seem to have just a, a command, uh, a calm that you are able to project that nobody would ever guess what's going on in your ear as well as within your field of vision that the viewers can't see. Um, how do you describe that ability to do that? I can't, I don't know. It's, it's just part of me, I guess. It's, if I'm going to be there, I, I, it, 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 boy. I don't take chances on a lot of things. I know what my limitations are. It doesn't say that I don't test those limitations sometimes but I'm not going to sit out here and, and go with something that I'm not sure of what it is. It just goes back to that other story. I looked and said, are you absolutely sure? Um, I, I think that I've covered enough of them that the story changes as it goes along, that, that the first report is never the most accurate report that you, that you get. And so I've just, through the years, have just said, to maybe to myself that, you know, we'll just take this as it comes. I'm going to report what I've heard, but we're not going to get too excited about it and we're not going to get too down about it and uh, we'll just move on. And that's, you, you just try to find the right words to say to carry that story because as you well know also, a lot of times you don't have that much information out here and you are repeating a lot of times the same thing over and over and over again, but it's it's how you phrase it and how you do it. and I go back maybe to my radio days of, of being able to readjust the story and find the new lead within the same story. Uh, all right, as long as we're dealing with uh, tragedy, which is an unavoidable part of our jobs, uh, where were you on the morning of September 11th, 2001? I was at home. Uh, wait, wait, 2001? Not the 9-11 attack. 9-11, yes, I was at home was uh, getting Tuesday ready to, uh, to come in and um, uh, heard as I got up, I was listening to the radio, and there was a report that a plane had crashed into one of the towers. Like, I think, just about everybody. Well, again, a small plane had crashed in. And then the report started coming in that was probably larger than that. And you think, wow, something went wrong with the guidance system or, or whatever it might be. 
And by the time I was dressed, uh, you know, the other plane had, had gone in into it, and uh, I just came into work. I mean, that's just that situation, you, that's what you do. You came in right away uh, as well. There you're hearing some very descriptive accounts of what happened at the World Trade Center today. Uh, well, that's when two planes, one crashed into each one of the buildings. In the end, both buildings collapsed. It, a plane also crashed into the Pentagon. And here locally, a United Airlines flight, number 93, from Newark, New Jersey, to San Francisco, has crashed in Somerset County. And um, it turned out to be a very long day, uh, to put it mildly. I mean, I don't think we left here till I don't know, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, it seemed like. Um, but well, unlike most stations around the country, we had our local story in Shanksville, Shanksville to cover as well as the national story in New York and in Virginia with the Pentagon. So it was a, it was a difficult day, um, to, put it, to, to put it in an yes. absurdly understated way. Um, and then in, um, in 2018 with the Tree of Life, uh, it was Saturday, 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 Saturday morning. Yep. Sabbath services about to begin at the synagogue. Go ahead. I uh, did not have the TV on or anything. Someone uh, texted me and said, uh, are you going into the station? And why would I go to the station? I mean, I didn't have a radio on, didn't have a TV on. I had no idea. So at that point, I did tune us in, and, the, and Andy Sheehan was, was reporting. Uh, I, I believe you had come in by that time, but I'm not quite sure what time you would arrive because you got here long before I did. And I checked with the station, and, and basically it was like, they were going to have you handle it for a certain period of time, and then I would would uh, would come back in, and uh, so that that's the way that one went. And it's um, you know someone had asked me about uh, which one of these stories stand out, and and you've covered enough of them as well. Uh, they're they're grouped into tragedy stories, and not a single one stands out over and above another one. I mean, the Hyatt Hotel Skywalk collapse in Kansas City, 114. The, the, the uh, plane crash here in Pittsburgh, uh, the Coates House Hotel fire, whatever it might be. Uh, but this one was, was unnerving because it was not a, an, an accident or, or something, a malfeasance by somebody who didn't put the, enough, uh, the right kind of nut in or bolt in in Kansas City. This was a deliberate uh, attack on somebody. And you'd already been through that with, with the uh, uh, exercise place, uh, LA Fitness, yes. right? Uh, yes. So uh, those are, I think the, the deliberate attack like that, like 9-11, um, those are almost in a way more difficult to handle because you're, as you're sitting out here, you're also questioning like everybody does at home, why would somebody do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, what triggered this? What was behind all of this? And uh, you just have to swallow some of those thoughts because that's not ours to make a judgment about. Right. And you know, when you're covering an event like the Tree of Life tragedy, if I'm remembering correctly, I handed off to you mm -hmm. at about the time, it was early evening, and there was a large crowd gathering at the corner of Forbes yes. and Shady. Yep. And you know, there were moments of beauty in that Remarkable. day, in the way people responded. Susan, you're absolutely right. It, it was, a phen I think, a phenomenal gathering almost spur of the moment kind of thing mm -hmm. after the shooting took place. The loss of 11 lives, several people critically wounded, others uh, recovering from their wounds. Uh, There's a huge round of applause also uh, when it was announced that the, it was the students who put this vigil together tonight. Yeah. So there's, there's more to it than just this horrific event. You see the full human, uh, you know, emotions and, and goodness in people coming forth almost immediately. And, uh, you know, you might want to, as I might want to, sitting on that desk, just sort of put your head down and take it all in, but you can't. You know, you have to, you have to narrate and you have to be the guide. You have to continually remind people. It's, um, it's the hardest thing I do. And, and again, you make it look easy. Well, thank you, but I... But, so I, I'm glad to hear that you, you know, you think about it too and you, 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 you struggle sometimes with the, you know, what's appropriate to say, what's not appropriate to say, how far ahead. You don't want to get ahead. Right, exactly. All of that. Just a little shop talk between, yeah. between <laughs> co-workers. Um, this job, um, people ask me, how do you, how do you do it? How do you, every day you're, you're sitting in that chair and you're talking about terrible things. And, uh, and yet you seem like you're a fairly 
<laughs> you seem a fairly normal person. How did you deal with that uh, after all these years showing up on the air? And no matter what kind of day you have had, at six o'clock you're in that chair and you are professional and 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 caring and kind and classy. Um, how, how have you approached that? I think you set up a wall. I think it's similar to what uh, police officers do and firefighters who see tragedy, uh, that, that you set up a wall, that you, you try not to let it uh, come in and affect you personally. But I think you will agree that there are times you do walk away from here and you start to reflect and it's, it's, it, it can, you can let some emotions out at, at some other times. And it, it, it builds up after a while, but then uh, you move on. And not every day is, is a tragedy day. You know? right. Uh, right. There are tragedies. I mean, the thing I've always tried to remember, Ken, is that, is that even that car accident, that's somebody. That's somebody's life. That, that's somebody's um, relative who just lost you know, a loved one. And um, each one of these stories, but you have to put up a, a, a wall to some degree, I think. And it's not that you don't care. It's just it's a job that you have to do. You couldn't do your job right. without that. More of KDKA's farewell to Stacy Smith right after this. Our news anchor Stacy Smith has been covering the past five presidential campaigns and he is again anchoring our live home team coverage of the convention from San Diego. Stacy. Thank you very much, Ken. There is nothing, of course, that can fire up a convention hall full of delegates than a speech by a former president. Well, these delegates tonight were treated to two speeches by former Presidents Bush and Ford. And for the first time, speaking before a national convention was General Colin Powell. So they were treated to that also. Um, you've covered how many political conventions? The first one was 1980, uh, 84, 88. I'm trying to remember if I went to one in 92. I don't remember going to one in 92, but... Uh, uh, that would have been uh, Clinton and... Clinton uh, and George W. George H. W. Bush. Yes. Uh, but, and then uh, 96, uh, I went to both uh, Republican and, and Democrat. And in 2000, Los Angeles for the Democratic Convention. And I think that was the last one that I went to. Yeah. 80, 1980 still stands out as, as the convention. It was my first one. Not, it doesn't stand out just because it was my first convention, but what was going on. You, you had an incumbent president in Jimmy Carter who was being challenged by Massachusetts Senator Ted Kennedy. I had interviewed Kennedy earlier in the, in the year at a presidential news conference. Uh, I asked the president the question, Mr. Carter, uh, but it was, it, was, it was a convention that there was really no doubt that Jimmy Carter was going to be renominated he was the incumbent but there was a little doubt because ted kennedy had had really started to capture uh, the uh, thoughts of a lot of democrats that maybe he might be better than jimmy carter because we were going through a whole, the whole malaise thing and uh, kennedy was offering hope which is what his his big campaign was about uh, too bad he didn't know how to answer the question, why do you want to become president, with the Roger Mudd asking. But um, During that convention, uh, Kennedy delivered basically his concession speech. And if they had taken the vote after that speech as, as to who was going to be the nominee, Kennedy would have won. It was the most electrifying speech on the convention floor that I've, I've ever uh, heard. And our good friend David Shribman will agree with me. He was there as well, the Post Gazette uh, executive editor emeritus. Uh, he, he was there as well, and it was, it was really it, there was some doubt whether the the uh, president was going to be renominated, and um, of course he was. But uh, it was it was an exciting commitment. Since that time, you never really had anybody that has put a challenge onto who the front runner is going to be. The hope endures, the cause yeah. goes on, the dream will never Very die. Very good. That's, you study that when yeah. you study political rhetoric. Um, you covered conventions at a time when they, they mattered in terms of news could actually happen. You know, they yes. became scripted, almost infomercials. But it was 80, was it not, when Reagan um, and 
No, Reagan, Reagan became the nom was the nominee in 1980. You're thinking in 1976 in Kansas City when Reagan challenged uh, Gerald Ford. I, I, I remember that. I'm, no, I'm thinking of when the deal was struck that Bush, oh, that Bush. would be the VP right. for Reagan. Which, which you know, was happening at the convention. Yes. Which would be un startling if there were, there were to be that level of uncertainty today going into one of these scripted that's, affairs. That's why I say 1980 was probably the best year for conventions yeah. because that's, uh, I think that may have been the last time that we really had that happen. Yeah. Uh, politics. Now, 92 was interesting, uh, but not necessarily the convention. Uh, but the primaries were interesting because uh, Clinton lost. Yes. New Hampshire. Yes. And, and then he comes back as a comeback kid. He, he, did, proclaim, he, he proclaimed himself the comeback, comeback kid. Yeah. He didn't even win anything, yeah. but he claimed he was a comeback kid. Yeah. Uh, so politics has always been uh, a passion of yours. You and I have discussed politics off the air, which is where it needed to be right. uh, many, many times. Uh, you visited the White House over the years, yes? Uh, 1988, uh, the president had uh, Reagan had just finished uh, another one of the summits with Gorbachev. And so they held a briefing and what the Reagan White House liked to do was bring in uh, anchors and reporters from the hinterlands and, and, the, and, and, and get the word out, not just through ABC, NBC, CBS, New York Times, that the, they, they went to the locals and brought them in so that they could get their message out that way. The purpose of the luncheon and a briefing held earlier with top White House aides was to talk about the Moscow summit. All the president's men and the president said they were pleased with the summit, but they cautioned not to expect too much out of the Soviets. And I was invited to, to uh, participate in the June 8th, I think it was 1988, uh, debriefing on that. Uh, the big thing about that one for me was, uh, because I'll never have it happen again, is I had lunch at the White House. And it, was a, it was in the East Room and, and uh, the, uh, the president was there and you sat there at a big table with a couple of other people and uh, my to my extreme right, right next to me on my right was Ken Duberstein, which at that time he was the assistant uh, chief of staff and soon thereafter became chief of staff. Found out he was from Reading, Pennsylvania. But, <laughs> but that was, yeah. Um, President John F. Kennedy assassinated, of course, 1963. Yeah. 25 years later. 20 years later. Oh, excuse 19, me. 19, 1983. 1983. Yeah, it was one of the first stories after Simon and Garfunkel uh, that, that I did. Uh, we traveled to uh, Dallas, uh, we traveled to Washington, D.C., and of course uh, here in Pittsburgh. And the, the, it was great connections because uh, Arlen Specter was the one who came up with a single bullet theory, and he was a United States Senator by that time. And you had Cyril Wecht, who was the first one to see the Kennedy autopsy papers and, and did not believe that there was a single bullet involved in this. So uh, it, it just really made it nice for us to be able to do a 20 anniversary, 20th year anniversary story on it. And part of the uh, story, as I say, we went down to Dallas, uh, that I remember is that um, we'd gone up to the uh, sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository building. And at that time, it was not a museum yet, but they still had not moved anything from, from that day of the assassination. And uh, we were allowed to open the window. I sat on the window frame and, and did a stand up there. It is obvious both sides are firmly entrenched. They will never agree whether Oswald acted alone when he shot President Kennedy from this window. And I have to tell you this, when you sit there in that window, I, I don't have a gun, I don't fire a gun. I've only maybe done it three times in my life and it's, just, it's not something that, that you know, fascinates me. But sitting there, you, you take a look at, at Elm and you go, that really looks like an easy shot. Now maybe it wasn't, but it didn't seem that far away. I mean, the yardage just didn't seem that that difficult to make that shot from someone who doesn't fire a gun. Yeah. Also in that interview, uh, we interviewed um, a, a nurse, uh, uh, Audrey Bell, who was the surgical nurse for John Conley, who was wounded in the Kennedy car. And um, this goes back to the single bullet theory in that she's, she said that, uh, you know, those, those little plastic cups you might get at the dentist's office to wash your mouth out mm -hmm. or something like that. That's what they used when they were taking the bullet fragments out. They would put them in there. And uh, she said that there were too many fragments that they had pulled from Conley that it couldn't have been a single bullet that did it. And so we had that. Didn't make any news, but it was, it was just fascinating to hmm. do that. Then we went to the National Archives, and there was the single bullet right there. And they laid it out for me. They had the rifle, uh, the Kennedy shirt, 
and the, and the bullet. Nobody disagrees with the commission about the use of this rifle. It was fired on November the 22nd in Dallas. But there is a lot of disagreement about this, the single bullet that supposedly hit Kennedy and then hit Conley. You got to see them up close. Up close and personal. I mean, I, I, it's as close as this mug is right here. I went like this to the bullet. Mm -hmm. and guards were okay with that? Uh, no, they were a little nervous, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> I thought you were going to steal If them. you'd like to see that bullet, I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More of KDKA's farewell to Stacy Smith right after this. Um, something else that those who uh, weren't in Pittsburgh at the time uh, might not be all that aware of, but how exciting it was to have breakthrough after breakthrough happening medically in Pittsburgh with transplantation. Um, transplant patients, we got to know them by name. Mm -hmm. Stormy Jones, and I'm thinking of these, these young patients, and many of them were the patients of Dr. Thomas Starzl. Uh, you got to know him and reported extensively on him. Yep. I did. Ray, nearly everyone in Pittsburgh knows his name and what he does, but few people have a chance to see Dr. Starzl at work. We got the opportunity a few weeks ago to follow him around for just a half a day. In that 12 hours, we got a glimpse of a man who will go down in medical history. We witnessed decisions concerning life and death, and we had the opportunity to see that what was, what was once a dream just 25 years ago is now a standard practice in medicine. Uh, Dr. Starzl and I uh, uh, seemed to hit it off. I, he trusted my reporting. And one of the things that uh, we were able to do was we were going to do a special on him, a th like a two-part series or three-part series. And uh, so we started following him around at, at 6 o'clock in the morning when he would start his morning rounds. And then we followed him through the day, and then they went to what they call the M&M conference, and they started talking about why they should or should not try to seek a liver for a particular patient. No names are ever used, just, just patient A, B, C, D, whatever it might be. And when that broke, that conference broke up, <clears throat> it was about maybe three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, he broke, it came out of there and he's got all of his uh, doctors around him and uh, he starts going through possible uh, locations they might go to retrieve livers and kidneys. And uh, he said, well, there's this uh, one in North Carolina. He said, I, I, I think I'll, I'll go do that one. And uh, I remember he said to one doctor, he said, um, are you off today? He said, yes. He said, well, then fine, you'll go with me to go. <laughs> that guy was, thought he had a day off, but he <laughs> didn't. Anyway, uh, we were invited to go along with him. So we get on the Learjet and we go down to, I, I'm guessing now it must have been Duke. I don't know because you just, we, I wasn't even sure where we were going except North Carolina. And uh, it was so new at that time that the, the operating room was just loaded with, with other surgeons who were watching what the master was doing. But before it started, uh, they were, again, we were retrieving a liver uh, and kidneys uh, from a young boy. And I looked over and he obviously was on a, a breathing machine to, to keep the organs alive, but he was dead. And I said to the doctor from, uh, North Carolina, I said, he looks fine. It was, he was a beautiful, blonde-headed boy. He just, uh, and I said, he looks fine. What, what happened to him? And he said, come over to this side. And I went over to that side, and there, was, there were four little marks on his head that were black and blue. And he said, you know what that is? I said, no. He said, it's his father's fist. Yeah. And so you, you start covering stories like that, and, uh, and you realize this is not just a story. This is, this is about a person and the person who lost their life and maybe another person will survive with it. So, so then we followed, we came back on the plane and then Starzl worked until about 2.30 in the morning getting the liver ready and they immediately put it in the other, uh, into the recipient. Hmm. So many occasions you traveled to interview interesting people or leaders in, in cases. Um, sometimes world leaders came here. Yes. Uh, March of 1988. March of 1988, if we're talking about Prince Charles. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he came to Pittsburgh. 
There was a conference of some sort taking place that uh, he, he participated in, and I may have all of the particulars wrong, uh, totally, but it had to deal with the, with the decline of the steel mills and the decline of, of jobs in the area, kind of matched an area in, in England that had gone through some of the similar problems. And so there was talk of how, how, how do we redevelop these areas? How do we, how do we create the jobs? And he was here to, to help us uh, talk about that as one of the reasons that he was here. And before he came, uh, we were told time and time again, and then after he arrived, that uh, this is royalty uh, and that you do not speak to him unless he speaks to you. And so, okay, fine. So uh, all his different visits, uh, we had, of course, had, had reporters there. I was uh, in Homestead when he was going in uh, to talk with George DeBolt about uh, some things. They had a, a, a mock design up and what, as to what the future could look like for some areas in the Mon Valley. And it, it, his, his limousine pulled up and he got out. First of all, it, what would be their Secret Service got out. And then he got out and he had this long walk. It was in an old school. And he was walking up the sidewalk and all of us are standing there and the photographers are standing there and nobody is saying a word. And, and he just kind of nods to us and, and walks. And I thought, you know what? He's in the United States. I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask him a question. And so uh, one of the most penetrating questions I have ever, ever asked. How do you like Pittsburgh so far, Your Royal Highness? How do you like it? How do you like it? Just a lot of snow. Thank you very much. Well, now, of course, you see in England, people yell questions at him all the time. But at that time, you didn't do that. You were the first. I, I believe I was the first. You broke the, the glass on I, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. World revolution on my yeah. part, yeah. More of KDKA's farewell to Stacy Smith right after this. Um, what are your memories of, of a very different city when you go back to 1983? When I go back to 1983, it was uh, in, a, in a lot of ways a city in, in turmoil uh, to, to a degree in that uh, <coughs> the downtown was torn up because we were putting in a, a subway. And at the same time, we had um, just you know thousands of steel workers who were losing their jobs. They were distraught. They didn't know where to go. An organization called DMS was formed and uh, they became, I'm not going to say violent, but they, they became uh, confrontational with, with uh, steel executives and with city government to a degree. Uh, it, you can't blame them, they've all lost their jobs, they have nowhere to go, and uh, they're just frustrated. They've lived their entire lives, their parents worked in the mills, their grandparents worked in the mills, and now it's all going away. So it was a city in, in turmoil in a lot of ways. Um, the city council was entirely different back then. Bill Burns used to call it the zoo because of so many different characters there. It was before it was represented by districts, they were at large. And so personalities could almost be elected, uh, you know, whenever they wanted to be. Uh, not if they wanted to be, but uh, personalities seemed to be elected more than others. Talking about Michelle Madoff, Jeep De Pasquale, Ben Woods, yes. and so on and so yes. on. Dwayne Darkins. Yeah, some larger than life personalities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Uh, did you at any time feel like um, Pittsburgh, you came here at a difficult time. Mm -hmm. Did you ever doubt whether you wanted to stay here for the remainder of your career? No, I think once I started, uh, once I started, I didn't really want to leave. If, if, if a, a really great offer had come along, let's say, you know, we want you to replace Con Cronkite, I, you know, you'd be a fool not to, not to try it at least, but Dan Rather got it instead of me, so I don't know. Well, they never really asked me, but anyway, Rather got it. But uh, no, I, once I was here, uh, we love the city, we really do. I've, uh, soon after I got, I'm growing up in the Midwest, I've always felt that, that Pittsburgh uh, is an eastern city with a Midwest flavor. It's, it's not an east coast city, it's Agreed. an eastern city. Yeah. All right, this is one of those unanswerable questions, but I'm gonna throw it at you anyway, because you're a pro. What has changed the most in the way this business operates over your 50 years in the business and 38 here at KDKA? Technology. When I started, we were using film. And, and so it took, if you, if you did a, I can't remember exactly what the phrase was, but uh, if you rushed it through, you could ruin the entire film, but it's a chance that you could get it out of there in 15 minutes or 10 minutes as opposed to maybe 25 to half an hour. Um, so film to, uh, to tape, uh, to live trucks with big masts that had to go up, uh, 
to uh, smaller cameras, digital, uh, and now to the point that uh, we don't have to worry about a, a, a live truck and a mast. Uh, we can just take a phone out and go live from some anywhere we want. That's that's the that to me is the is the biggest change. There used to be technological which which only enhances what we can do. Yes, but it also enhances the burden upon us who do it. And what I was going to say is there used to be technological limits to what we could do. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we want you to go to Harrisburg, interview a bunch of legislators, talk to the governor, and then drive it back, and we'll put it on the air the next night. Right. No such luxury now. No. As soon as you're done talking to those legislators, you have to turn it around and have it on TV in 20 minutes. Yes. You know, that sort of thing. Um, Which is more difficult because uh, the other way, you had time to really put the story together in your mind. Yeah. And um, yeah. now it's it's... It's more like covering a, a breaking story and that you have to do it that way right away. Not even, you, you don't even have time to, um, to digest it before you, you're putting it on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, yeah. all of that too. It's, uh, it's incredible to think about the way Pittsburgh, not only this business, but the way Pittsburgh has changed since you arrived here. Um, I know you're responsible for all of the good things <laughs> all and the good the things, yeah, right. Uh, but again, you went from a, a steel town in decline you know, the last few gasps of the steel industry in the 1980s, uh, the medical and banking um, systems really just, just beginning to come into their own education, software, robotics. As you think about now, about Pittsburgh now, as you're about to, uh, to leave the day-to-day -day reporting, are you optimistic? Uh, what, what do you think about the city that you decided to make your own way back in 1983 on the 4th of I, July? I think when, when you asked you know, what, city, what the city was like, and I said to me it was a city in, in turmoil in, in a lot of ways, we came out of that because of, I think, some, some good city leadership, uh, elected officials, and obviously an input uh, from the business community at that time and also from the uh, educational institutions. And somewhere along the line, as you well know, the phrase was eds and meds. You know, it was education and medicine that helped lead Pittsburgh through uh, the, the 90s. But at that same time, there were some great corporate leaders in this town as well, and, and Tom Usher and Tom O'Brien and, and Jim Rohr and, and some, other, some of the others who really had a vision that Pittsburgh should be a number one city in all ways it, it possibly could. And they helped push, push that. I mean, the, Sophie Masloff dreamed of a new baseball stadium, and they got one. Uh, not be, just because she dreamed of it, but but because uh, it, well, they it laughed could at her. They laughed at her, yeah, and then she got did. the last laugh. A lot of people did. Yeah. But they really pushed the, the city to that degree, and I think uh, Pitt, CMU, especially at CMU, the, the big push into, into the uh, technology in there and artificial intel intelligence, uh, is is really helped put this city even more on the map. Uh, I, I would like to see the city and its leadership do more to get the Apples and the, and the Microsofts and the Googles and whoever. They all have a presence here, mm -hmm. but we're, we continue to find out they're opening new offices with more employees in, in other cities, and, I, and I'd like to see more of a push somehow to make that happen, and I'm not quite sure how that happens, but maybe when I run for office, I'll do that. All right. Yeah. You, would you care to make an announcement as we no, sit here today? Yeah, no desire to run for office. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> I like to sit back and, and talk about it. <laughs> okay. uh, I know you love to golf. Are there any thoughts of, uh, of leaving Pittsburgh for a more golf year-round type community? Or are we going to still run into you around town? No, I played golf over the weekend, and I finally came to the realization at that point that I was probably not going to make the tour. You all, that just occurred to you? Just occurred to me. That I was probably not going to make the tour. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, no, I, I like to play golf, but it's, it's not the end all by any means. You're a grandfather? Yes, I have uh, four granddaughters and uh, love them all equally. It's, it's great to have them. Someday you'll have it, you'll understand it. Uh, your wife has retired after a career in education. Yes. Uh, so these are, these are the reward. This is the good years, right? Yep. Uh, any plans you'd like to share? No, I'll, 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 I will say this, that, that uh, we talked about how this business has changed, and of course now uh, television itself is changing, and then everybody's going to the, to the streaming aspect. 
I, I'd like to try to see if there's something I could pursue in that. I mean, I'm being totally honest. I, I don't know what it would be, how I'm going to do it, but maybe something there. Interesting. Yeah. You're not going to compete with us, are you? No, no, no. I wouldn't compete. <laughs> uh, maybe we can go a joint venture on some sort. <laughs> All right. We can sit here and talk to each other and people will watch it. I'll give you a number. You can call my people. Okay. More of KDKA's Farewell to Stacy Smith right after this. So, you know, I was thinking this earlier, now that, you've, now that we've shared these stories, um, for a kid from, who got his start in Muncie, Indiana, on a radio station, uh, to have lunch at the White House and to, to meet Pope John Paul II and interview a young Benjamin Netanyahu and, uh, you know, sit in the window of the Texas School Book Depository, Nobody would have believed no. that that was your destiny because that's it was just, it's too much. It's no. if, if I had said, this is what I want to do. And here's the things I'm going to do over the yeah, next 50 yeah. years. No, yeah. no way. It just, yeah. as you well know, there's a bug about doing this business that you just want to be part of it. You just want to be on the air. And if you can report that story, if you can anchor and, and go to different people who are going to tell the story, and then if you can put your two cents in on breaking news, whatever it might be. That's all you're looking for. You're not, you're not looking to try to do these things. Right. And I've just been absolutely blessed that I've been able to do those things. A lot of pinch me moments. Yes, without question. You're 50. Unfortunately, a lot of times you don't realize that they are pinch me moments because it's part of the job. You're just doing it and right. you're excited about doing it, but right. then you're moving on to the next one. And then when you have a time to reflect back, you went, wow, I got to do that. Right. Well, because you had a deadline looming. Yeah. How are you going to deal with a, a lifetime without deadlines? You're going to be able to go where you want and not worry that you have to be anywhere at any particular time. Well, I don't know. We'll have to see what Sharon says about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, you'll check with your chief of staff. I'll check with my chief of All staff. Right. It'll okay. let me know. All right. It's impossible to, to encapsulate your career in the short amount of time we have, but... Um, is there something I, I haven't touched on? Is there something that you wanted to mention about your reporting experience, your your time in Pittsburgh, characters you may have uh, and come to know, and um, you know, there, there's there's so much to a to a career, let alone a 50-year career. But what am I forgetting? I think you've covered covered a lot. I mean, I could go through a, a lot of stories that I've covered uh, that uh, really. Are, are mean more to me than to probably to anybody else. But um, no, I, 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 I reflect and um, I've not done every single thing I would like to have done, but I've done a heck of a lot. It's um, for someone who started off walking in this business, it's been a great run. Agreed. Beyond great. Stacey, it's been a pleasure. Ben, thank, thank you. you. We'll miss you. Thank you. <laughs>